Well, um, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, it's it's good to be with you. Um, and um, let's go. Um, so Petra and the Nabataeans in Biblical Perspective. So we're basically looking at two things in this little talk. First of all, how the Nabataeans um, intersected with salvation history in the Bible, one. And secondly, how the archaeology of Petra and the pagan Arab um, Nabataeans um, uh, helps us understand the background of the Bible um, better. Um, so that's where we're um, that's where we're going today. Just wondering what to do with this little thing. Yeah. Okay. Um, who were the Nabataeans? Well, this is much much better covered in other websites and that kind of thing. They may have been descendants of Ishmael's eldest son, um, 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 but most people don't accept that anymore. They were an Arab people who ruled over the pagan kingdom to the south um, of Herod's Jewish kingdom. So they were the nearest neighbors to the Herodian Jewish kingdom um, in the north. And they were very big uh, regional players at their peak a couple of centuries before Christ and a century afterwards before being annexed, annexed by the Romans in um, AD um, 106. So a, a, a pagan um, Arab people. How do they intersect with salvation history? Herod the Great's mother was Nabataean. Uh, Herod's father was Edomite, and some see the Edomites as Arab. Um, once a member of the Nabataean royal family wanted to marry, marry Herod the Great's sister, but was told he'd have to convert to Judaism. Um, Herod Antipas, who was responsible for the death of, of John the Baptist, his first wife was Nabataean, and he divorced um, his Nabataean wife uh, to marry Herodias. So we can say that the pagan Nabataeans, Arabs, intermarried with the Jewish Herods, Jewish by conversion, of course. Herod the Great um, tried to murder all, they tried to kill Jesus by ordering the murder of all the children under two years old in Matthew 2. He knew about this from the Magi, who are more likely from their gifts to be Arab rather than from um, Persia. Um, this is a picture of Makeros, where Josephus said um, uh, Herod Antipas had John, John the Baptist beheaded. Um, his divorce of his Nabataean wife caused him problems later on, and, and in the end he was um, exiled to um, France. So, first connection of the Nabataeans with the narrative of the Bible is that the notorious Herod the Great was half Nabataean. The second connection con uh, concerns the Apostle Paul, who refers to a Nabataean king by name in 2 Corinthians, and who also spent the first three years of his new Christian life in the Nabataean kingdom somewhere. Um, so we're starting in Damascus, but don't worry, we're getting to Petra fairly soon. At the time of Paul's conversion near Damascus, the city was under some sort of Nabataean control. Kokab on the outskirts of Damascus is one of the possible sites of Paul's conversion. Um, close to the east gate of the old city is another possible site, but we do not know exactly where Paul met the risen Christ. And obviously, um, when the hue and cry was out to get Paul, this gate um, would have been guarded to, <clears throat> to stop him from um, leaving the city and, and to arrest him. Anyway, the reaction to his preaching um, meant uh, that it was difficult for him to remain in Damascus because the Nabataean king, Aratus IV, wanted him um, arrested. He had to be let down in a basket um, from the, um, the wall. Uh, basket like that, maybe. Um, to this day, um, you can still see houses on the wall. Here are a couple of them in the Damascus Old City. These ones are near the chapel that marks the possible spot 
of his no doubt bumpy descent to street level. This is part of Straight Street. Um, this is a suggested site of Ananias's house where they built a chapel, which is several feet lower than today's old city, which has obviously been built up um, over the centuries. Now, Paul says in Galatians 1.17 that he spent three years in Damascus and Arabia. And Arabia, by universal consent, there's no doubt about this, um, means the Nabataean kingdom, the area that was controlled by the Nabataeans. He went into Arabia either to have his understanding of the whole Old Testament reset in the light of his encounter with Christ, or to preach the gospel, or both. What this means, and I don't know the significance, but Paul tells us this, is that his conversion and his early life as a believer took place in the pagan Nabataean kingdom. Where he spent these three years in the Nabataean kingdom, we don't know. Uh, was it in southern Syria to the south of Damascus, the Leger, um, in biblical Beishan? Because by the time of Paul, the center of gravity of the Nabataean kingdom had moved north from Petra, and eventually its new capital became Bosra, in southern Syria, but don't confuse that with biblical Bosra, <clears throat> nothing to do with it, with it. We're now in southern um, um, Syria, uh, in a town called um, Bosra. Between Bosra in the south and Damascus to the north is a wild area called the Leger, meaning refuge, which is just the sort of area a fugitive like Paul would go to, to be safe until the hue and cry, cry died down. Very difficult of access. It's uh, from the volcanic outflow of the volcanoes in southern Syria. It will be quite difficult to send your chariots with horses in to arrest somebody there because communications weren't brilliant because of the nature of the terrain. So Paul could have been there. It was in the biblical area of Beishan, famous for its oaks and bulls. Um, and in the background is the former volcano of Jebel el Arab which dominates this whole um, area. So to recap, the pagan Arab Nabataean kingdom, then at the peak of its power, was the setting for Paul's meeting the risen Christ and was also the setting for his earliest years as a new Christian. And we know this because of what Paul wrote, not from any speculation on our part. It's, it's possible, of course, that Paul could have spent the three years in the Petra area rather than in Syria. But whatever the case, we're now moving to Petra, which can give us real insights into the pagan world and its thinking at the time of Christ, and also the whole idea of, of, of temple, um, whether a Jewish temple or pagan temple. Uh, the trademark image of Petra is actually just the VIP tomb of Aratus IV, who we saw on that coin. But there's some evidence that there may have been sacrifices offered there, uh, e.g. for the soul of the king. But, but that's basically um, the trademark image, a, a glorified tomb. Um, one or two other pictures um, of um, this most wonderful of tombs. Now, an inscription found in another tomb, um, not actually this one in the picture, uh, points to the pagan consecration of the Petra tombs, so that Petra tombs had a religious significance. This tomb and all the rest of the property, which is in these places, are sacred and dedicated to Dushara, the god of our Lord and his sacred throne and all the gods. Petra was the religious center of the Nabataeans as well as the capital. It's a theme park for paganism at the time of Christ. It contains thousands of pagan symbols and images. Um, in the niches everywhere are the so-called Betils, Betil, Betel, House of Gods. These are their gods. 
Because they do not take uh, human or animal form, they're called aniconic. And the niches and their, their battles um, are everywhere, their idols are everywhere in Petra. You're in a completely religious um, city when you visit um, Petra. This uh, idol is one of the many guarding the water channel that flows immediately below it through the sea or the main entryway into Petra. If you've been to Petra, you'll know there's this narrow canyon you go through to enter the, the main part of the city. And it, it, it's, it has water channels flowing through it and there are uh, idle um, niches guarding this, um, these water channels. Uh, without the water, you die. So they, they were, that's what they were doing. Uh, here are several niches together in an alternative entryway into the city. Although this is called a god or gin block, it's believed to be a memorial for dead people rather than um, an idol. These pyramids um, are, uh, stand symbols of the spirits of deceased people buried with the upper chamber. In the lower chamber of this particular tomb, the top of which is visible in the picture, is a dining hall. It seems that feasts for dead ancestors will be held in such dining halls, obviously, again, with religious significance. As well as idols, Petra had a number of high places where sacrifices were made to their gods. There is a theory that all of these were pointing to the highest mountain in the area, which is called Aaron's tomb. It's not, but there's a theory that this was a sacred mountain. It doesn't have any high places on it. And all the high places were pointing towards it. So uh, Aaron's tomb mountain, uh, a possible sacred mountain, because there are no high places on this mountain. Um, and this was the place where they may be considered the god of the mountain, Dushara, the head of the Nabataean, um, sort of basically three gods, um, lived, quote unquote. Petra has fine examples of biblical high places. This one is probably based on an early Edomite one, and sacrifices took place here and offerings were made. Uh, another, another Petra high place. And um, in the uh, round area, it's where they would have sacrificed animals and where the blood of the sacrifices would be drained um, away. Pet is at the end of the main drag. Um, there are four temples, three Nabataean and one Roman. The Nabataean ones are very helpful in understanding the concept of temple in the Bible. And I think it's very important to, to, to stress, probably you know this, but all ancient Near Eastern temples are very similar, whether they're Jewish, whether they're Solomon's temple, Herod's temple, or pagan, except for the huge difference that the pagan ones put their god, their idol, in the Holy of Holies. On the other hand, the, the, the Jewish temples, the Holy of Holies is empty, except, of course, for cherubim, but there's no god there. But, but otherwise, a temple is a temple is a temple, and it really doesn't make any difference in, in many respects, or whether it's um, Jewish or pagan. So a temple, and this is um, the great temple at Petra, will normally have an enclosed sacred area. And that's the big uh, area in front, the courtyard. Um, then a sanctuary, which is usually confused with the temple itself, um, which contains the Holy of Holies and altars um, as well. Altars for animal sacrifice and for incense, which of course the Nabataeans had the franchise um, basically for, for incense um, in the Middle East. There may also be a ceremonial gate stairway, and there obviously there are other uh, details. Um, but the sanctuary behind um, is, is basically um, just a part of the temple, maybe the most important part, but the temple itself includes these courtyard areas. And these components are common, as we said, to all uh, ancient Near Eastern temples. You can see many of these uh, in the first temple we'll look at, the, the great temple with the courtyard in front. You can see the stairway 
and then behind is a second stairway, a second courtyard, and then the sanctuary. Or is it? Things start to get a little bit weird here. In the sanctuary, where you'd expect to have the Holy of Holies, there's a semicircular theater outlined in yellow here. So here's the theater. It, slap bang in where you'd expect to have the um, Holy of Holies. What's going on here? It's not clear what it's doing here because there's a basic principle in the ancient Near East, um, once a holy place, always a holy place. You don't generally in the ancient Near East deconsecrate um, a holy place. We also don't know with the great temple where the main altar was, although small altars were found on the premises. But I think it's important to say, and this is a rare view of the great temple, that the great temple went through several rebuildings uh, during its life. Um, archaeologists aren't idiots. If they say it's a temple, it's a temple. But, but I, I don't think anybody really knows why um, or what it was doing in the temple at Petra. Uh, here's a sort of view from above. This is pre-drones. Uh, you can see a big courtyard. So a big part of the great temple was the courtyard in front. And then you can see on the right, the um, sanctuary uh, with the weird um, theater in it. But as you can see, the, the courtyard covers a bigger area, the front courtyard or the Teminos, than the sanctuary behind it. Qasr al-Bint temple, this is the second, this is the entrance to the temple. Uh, I repeat, what this, uh, gateway is, is the entrance to the temple. It's not the entrance to the sanctuary. So in front of us is this big courtyard, and then behind is the sanctuary part uh, in the distance. Or if you prefer the expression, a big temple complex with a big, so there's a big courtyard area as you can see, and then the sanctuary containing the Holy of Holies um, behind it. And this is, I probably got this wrong, but um, this is from above. Um, and that, that would be roughly the area of the temple, very roughly. I probably got it wrong. But as you can see, the um, sanctuary is, is a relatively small part in, in space of the temple. Another view of the sanctuary um, with, uh, um, uh, and then behind the, you can see the entrance behind, which actually goes into the Holy of Holies. In front of the sanctuary was a large altar for animal um, sacrifices. In other words, the Qasr al binit temple at Petra is a relatively uncomplicated example of, a, of an ancient Near East temple at the time of Christ with regard to its major components, and also with regard to its size, although of course it was smaller than Herod's temple. Now, and this is one of the important points uh, <clears throat> I'd sort of like, like to make, which you probably know, but um, Solomon's temple would have been much smaller and um, the next slide shows a contemporary temple to Solomon's temple. Um, and compared to the temples they were building in Herod's time, which Herod obviously followed, um, Solomon's temple was different altogether. So if you look at this one, um, a Hittite temple um, from the figures on the left, uh, you can see it's much, much smaller than uh, Qasr al-Binit and, and, and the Great Temple. I mean, this is based, there's probably a bit of a courtyard area around about it, but this is basically the, um, uh, the size of the whole temple. Um, and you could fit um, a number of those in, in, the, in the temple space at Qasr al-Binit. And it's, it's really, I think, um, many think that, that kind of God condescends to, um, to make uh, his temple, Solomon's temple, um, what people were used to 
in the way of temples at the time. This particular temple has many, many design features in common with um, Solomon's temple. Um, the third and smallest Nevertean temple is called the Temple of the Winged Lions. Um, its name takes us straight back to Daniel 7 and Revelation 4, because a winged lion makes an appearance, suggesting that, that that's um, familiar imagery in the ancient Near East at the time of Christ. Um, the lions were atop the central columns. The Temple of the Winged Lions has been extensively restored, and these two pictures are actually before its restoration. Um, uh, here the altar is actually in the sanctuary. Uh, is this another weird feature of Petra temples? Not really. The um, second main type of Syrian temple um, had the altar in the sanctuary. The, sac the altar doubled as a place for sacrifices, and it also at the same time is where you put God stones to represent the um, deity or deities. Um, so the basic design feature of these temples um, was the same as Herod's temple in Jerusalem uh, and Solomon's earlier temple and the tabernacle of the people of God in the wilderness, which, as you know, is basically a kind of portable temple. So you've got courtyards, altar and sanctuary with the Holy of Holies. Um, the fourth and most dangerous of the Petra temples, and this is a view inside it, it's not very big, um, is the Imperial, Imperial Cult Temple. Now this takes us straight back to the book of Revelation. Revelation was written against the background of the Roman Imperial Cult, where there was um, sometimes some sort of uh, emperor worship, um, if there wasn't emperor worship, you might well have uh, be asked to offer sacrifices to keep the gods of the city happy. Um, or you might be asked to offer sacrifices to, um, in order um, that, uh, um, for the health of the emperor, sorry. Um, and... Although this imperial cult temple at Petra was very small with, uh, in comparison with the grand uh, Nabataean ones, for Christians, it would have been the most threatening because it's possible if you were a Christian then, you might have had to offer sacrifices um, as happened um, uh, during the early church um, period. So not very big. You can see the staircase. You can see a little courtyard with those two big stones on it. And then you can see the, the sanctuary um, of the temple um, in, the, in the picture. Um, tons of costly blue and white marble were used in its facing and a few bits um, were still um, um, in place in 2008. Okay. Um, at some point, um, Petra uh, became a Christian Arab city uh, with its own bishop. Now, this is um, important um, because um, one of the um, narratives is that um, uh, the time before the dominant religion here uh, was a time of ignorance, and uh, in order to be a true Arab, you need to be a follow, follower of the dominant um, religion here. But um, the importance of Christian Petra was, was that it was a Christian um, Arab city um, before um, the dominant religion took over the um, area. This is a picture um, of the urn tomb, um, which became the first Petra cathedral um, in the fifth um, century. There's a picture inside, they found a little inscription there. And um, so the tomb was uh, converted um, into a church. 
um, effectively. Um, this is the um, blue church um, uh, called from the uh, blue columns um, in the um, uh, which were imported. And here uh, is the base of a pulpit. So we have visible proof that the word of God was preached in Petra, would have been in Greek, which was the official language of the area. You can see the pulpit uh, in the Jordan Museum in Amman. This is uh, the base um, of it. And this again is significant because now um, Petra has moved from following a religion based on images to a, um, a word-based faith um, based on Christ. Um, in the main Petra church, um, the Petra scrolls were found, um, which are a treasure trove of information about Christian Arab Petra in the seventh century. This is a, a very fine um, baptistry um, from the main um, Petra, um, main Petra um, church. Um, just a brief word about Petra scrolls. They, um, some of the longest uh, uh, documents in late antiquity, if not the longest, and they give us, um, tremendous insights uh, into Christian Arab Petra before the coming of the dominant religion um, to the area and show that this was a, a sophisticated um, culture um, at the time. So um, as we uh, come to an end of, of this quick um, run through, we leave Petra uh, as an Arab Christian city on the eve of the new era when the region was taken over by its new Muslim rulers, nonetheless remaining majority Christian for a few centuries to come. This is the monastery at Petra, um, so-called because of the crosses found inside, evidence of some kind of Christian um, use. So this, this kind of sums up Petra. Um, Nobody is exactly sure what, uh, what this was used for. It's probably multi-use. It looks as though there may have been space in front for a meeting of a, of a group um, of people. There's some kind of holy of holies um, inside. But um, at, at the end, um, it came into some sort of um, Christian use. So this uh, fabulous uh, tourist place of, of Petra um, changed um, from a um, theme park in, in, in the sense of, of, of paganism um, to become a Christian um, Arab city. And Christians carried on as the, as the majority under their new uh, Muslim rulers um, for another um, 200 years, um, roughly. Okay, well, that, that's it. Um, anybody's got any questions, we, we, we can go on, um, we can talk.